We are back at the Verdi Music Hall for the second round robin of the 2019 group stage. You're getting a look at a cake made by LEC's number one and best stats analyst, Connie Lee. This is an all edible baron with buttercream, milk crumb, as well as in the bottom tier, marbled peanut butter and jelly filling. I'm shocked. Excited to get back into things with Raz, Spawn, and Vedius. That might be my favorite opening of a show ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, Connie designed some fantastic cakes, but the impressive part about it is how she even designed the Baron herself. Like, fantastic job. Yeah. I don't even want to eat the cake. I just want to look at it. No, well, I need uh, that. Anything, <laughs> uh, I need it. anything also, you know, 10 years celebration. There's all kinds of stuff, including a nice cake. Fantastic. But today it's also about the teams and about the World Championship. And the first days of groups delivered some hype results. And these are the standings. So with the first set of games squared away and a lot happening, what are your main takeaways of the first four days? Well, right now the East just looks really strong. And when you have a look at how these groups are playing out, there's a chance that G2 will get out most likely but then where are the rest of the western teams going to come from they need to make a big push in this second week that's why i looked at group d and instantly i cling on to team liquid because coming into uh worlds i thought dom one and invictus gaming for sure but then team liquid had a great game versus dom one certainly competitive versus invictus gaming i think for groups a and c a lot of the results are as expected i think for group d depending on who you ask is a little bit more contentious but i think group b has by far been the most surprising group that we've seen with a lot of upsets happening, a lot of teams kind of uh, performing not at the level that we expected as well. And I think that it's only going to make for today a very exciting day. You're right. Most of the things kind of normalized after the first couple of days of groups, but not Group B. That's no. just a <laughs> bit of a mess. Um, when we look overall pre-tournament, we said SKT, G2, FPX possibly as big favorites for the tournament. How do we feel about those now? I still think that SKT is one of the favorites for the tournament. One of the questions I had coming in was, SKT seem a little formulaic in their approach to the game. Strong early game, good team fighting, Faker and Cleared really being the core. But surely there's going to be a team good enough to be able to challenge them. RNG came close, but it was not enough. They are showcasing why this organization is always able to come in at tournament form and why they are one of the favorites still to win the tournament. Yeah, and I think that Khan is having a much better tournament this time around, but if you are coming in with maybe the best jungler in the world, it's very hard to attack the early game. That's where people have gone to the Korean powerhouses in the past, and I think so much of this now is about how well Clid has been able to cement the early game of SKT. Yeah, and Faker for me is the person that I look towards, like his twisted, twisted Fate play was great. There were times in which during that game that we were referencing in the RNG game where there were certainly bad plays around Elder Dragons or those calls, but ultimately they can take a step back, think about the plays that they're looking for, and ultimately play to their qualms. Something I saw from someone on Twitter today is how we never really call out the fact that some of the players on SKT are not veterans, are also players that are relatively new to the biggest stage and the international stage, yet we kind of gloss over that because they are in this SKT machine. And I think we're starting to see um, kind of the traces of that and how strong they're developing. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I also think that playing domestically in a league like the LCK prepares you better for the world stage than maybe any other league historically in League of Legends. And I think that Effort and Clid have been able to go through a very good season so far. SKT looking fantastic. Secondly, maybe a bit more controversial, G2 still favorites, but how are we feeling about their last couple of games? Well, they were my favorites coming into the tournament. I still think they are the favorites of the whole tournament. This is a team that can play fast, they can play slow, they have so many other looks that they can give towards you. However, I do want to say that this is starting to look almost IG-esque in how they're you approaching. World Champions, World Champions IG? IG? Oh, yeah. No, MSI <laughs> IG, unfortunately, in how their group stage is getting a little bit rough, and I think that I'll always give them the benefit of the doubt. Until you beat the champ, they're the champ, and I think that that is how I'm going to approach it. However, there are a couple too many fun games for maybe my liking at the moment. I feel like G2 is a team that's whole foundation is built off of fun. And you're going to get the two extremes. The best, which is what we saw against Griffin, and what we saw against H2K, which is arguably some of their worst. But the one thing you can say is whenever someone stumbles, someone is able to pick up the pieces. And that is what I think makes G2 so strong as a team. Uh, lastly, RNG has been really impressing me, Raz, and I know the same goes for you. Are they emerging as the biggest favorite for the LPL right now? For sure. I think coming into the tournament, you know, a lot of people pegged them as to be a bot side centric team, and they're still doing great regarding that. Uzi's just pummeling lanes consistently. <laughs> 
But now they're giving a lot of presence towards Long Xing and towards uh, Xiaohu as well. They're showing that diversity or at least the willingness to play to those lanes. And so but the games that we're seeing, they look fabulous. And look, Royal has gone to a final twice with just playing around raising the puppy. They need a little bit more if they want to win a final, however. And I think that the ability to give resources to Xiaohu especially is going to be important. Their MSI run where it looked like they might be able to take it but ultimately fell down to the CLGs and uh, SKTs was the year where it looked like that mid lane focus was doing great things for this lineup. And I just love the fact that we're seeing confidence in the facilitators because there's always pressure on the players like Long Xing or even in this case, Karsa. But Karsa, when he came onto his lease in play, had great great uh, flash kicks or ward hop kicks mm -hmm. that you wouldn't really expect in incredible pressure moments. It doesn't really feel like they're feeling that. For sure. Definitely a team to keep our eyes on going forward, but a large part of groups were also influenced by different teams' interpretations of the bot lane meta, namely the prevalence of bot lane mages. So I do want to ask, why and when should you go mages off of the games we've seen? Well, what I've seen so far is if you have a weak bottom lane that you want to hide, there's a lot of good picks right now. And some of them are in the form of the mages. We've seen a lot of Viga picked up, as well as different looks of the Morgana. And I think that with so many dominant AD carry players that are going to play your, in your face in lanes, it gives you another legitimate option to bring utility into that bottom lane. I also just think that in the current meta, there aren't that many strong AD carries. Zaya, Kaiser, and Ezreal to a lesser degree are the three that we've been seeing at this tournament. But outside of that, uh, many teams don't really want to experiment or utilize some of the other ADs and just feel that going towards mages or more aggressive uh, bot lane picks are the better way to play the bot lane right now. Or if you do like the Marksman, they fit a different role better. The Tristana and the Lucian seem to be much better solo lane picks right now than they do in that bottom lane. But there is also a big question because we've seen varying results of people picking mages in the bot lane. It seems to me that for some teams, it's a band-aid that doesn't even cover everything. And in some cases, it's a huge, huge advantage. Advantage. Yeah, I know we were having a discussion before the show actually began about which teams we feel confident using it just for like playstyle centric reasons. Like, because I looked at the uh, uh, the Fnatic game and I thought that that was them going up against RNG, not feeling the most confident playing pound for pound bot side. And then we also saw like, for instance, Damwon actually utilize the Vagar game, and those are the instances that we've been seeing just band aid performances. Yeah, uh, fun fact: Sneaky has the highest damage percentage out of all bot laners or all <laughs> marksmen at Worlds as well as the highest damage per minute. But that's just for me to show that you can put a Band-Aid on that, but when it comes to other phases of the game, you might not necessarily have a lot to fall back on. And this is something that I feel quite strongly about where we see it as a Band-Aid because they haven't been able to perform, but I think that from the team's perspective, they look at these picks as the strongest that you can play in that position right now. Yeah. And I think that an experience problem is what's hurting a lot of these players to have these impact. And unfortunately for Sneaky, he went up against the best bot lane mage player that exists probably in the world right now. So he got, you could see the difference in that. But I feel that Given that we're in week two of groups, given that now you can't afford to make these mistakes, I believe you should just rely on your experience and go off of what got you here in the first place. Because you have to remember, even if you're practice on the pick, the team most likely will not be, and it warps the way that you have to play the game around it. For so long, Cloud9 has been a team that can play around their consistent threat in the bottom lane in Sneaky, and these majors come online at, you know, the two item mark, and are not the consistent output of DPS, unless you're willing to play Cassiopeia bot. Similar story for Fnatic, where Reckless is at the bottom of all damage output because that just hasn't been working for them. So I think we're going to see a lot of different looks for teams that need to catch up on games coming into this stage of the group stage. Now, uh, on top of that, we have some big celebrations. And over the last couple of days, we've been celebrating that 10 years of League of Legends. And alongside the absurd amount of announcement was also League's newest champion to the roster.
love it so much. Yes! <laughs> I just want to see the champion instantly. Yeah. Support Marksman, by yeah, the way. What is, what is that going to be? <laughs> yeah, it, I, th I think I speak for everyone. As soon as she shoots Lucian, I'm like, oh my oh, goodness. No. Yeah, oh, I'm no. like, oh, what is this monster. betrayal? Exactly yeah. right. Like, this, the quest is finally over and he's just going to get capped for it. But <laughs> I think that uh, I, I just love that, that another different archetype has been introduced into the game. I'm very intrigued to see how it gets utilized on the pro level. Me too. And if you want to learn more about the return of Senna, you can also check out her bio on universe.leagueoflegends.com and I believe Lucian's and Thresh's are also updated because she's back. Crazy stuff. Uh, no Senna yet, of course, hopefully in next Worlds. But moving forward, though, every group is going to play out their remaining round robin and any subsequent tiebreakers taking place at the end of the day. So TLDR, one group per day, step up on the day, and you're going to quarters. Don't step up, and you're going home. And for me, some of the big matchups of the day are J-Team versus Splice. If Splice end up losing this game, it becomes significantly harder to be able to qualify out of groups. And then for GAM, they're going to have to come up clutch against FPX themselves. They got demolished last time, and if they want to stand a chance, I feel like that these first two games are going to be pivotal in determining the rest of the group. Yeah, 100%. I think for FPX, the most the games I'm most concerned for are not only the ones that you mentioned the first one of the day, but also the last one of the day going up against J-Team. Raz, this was supposed to be the free group. Why are you worried about anyone that <laughs> FPX is playing at the moment? Top seed coming out of the LPL. You have to think they're still favorites to get out. Yep, I'm just using the word if. Very <laughs> lightly. Very lightly. They're not going to lose a game today. The fact that they lost one at the beginning was just a lesson. All right, talk to us then about the perceived tournament favorite status of FPX. In the beginning of the group stage, we were a little iffy on it. Yeah, I mean, look. That game, a lot of it came down to just individual mistakes. A lot of people honed in and focused on uh, LWX in particular. And if you looked at this uh, Baron Steel and also just the fight, you just saw really messy, uncoordinated fights that you don't see from FPX during the entire summer split. And I think that a thing that we have to mention is once again, the relative age and experience on the international stage. A lot of these players are brand new and they would be nervous coming in as the LPL's number one representative has been a cursed spot in the past. And FPX had so many expectations that anything short of flawless gameplay was going to make us doubt them. But I think that we have seen them return to form. They came off the quickest game now of the group's Return to form. Yeah. Yeah. They've had one game against Gam where they got given Kiana and then he just snowballed the entire game off of it. Okay, so let me just ask you a quick question, Betty. So Gam versus Hong Kong Attitude, who would win? Gam versus Hong Kong Attitude, yeah. it would be close. I think the Gam would an probably answer. take that. And then I think Hong Kong Attitude versus G2 was Dude, a very oh, nice okay. game. So we're using transitive properties now. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. All I'm saying here, all I'm saying is that FPX are yet to prove to me that they are completely back in form. I feel the only consistent players we've seen on this roster so far are Tian and Crisp. And I think what the, while they are performing well, I'm not going to give them a free pass today. I am convinced that they will lose one game today. I just have no idea which one it is. Okay. Well, we okay, have some more right. time, so what do FPX, what should FPX do to be favorites in the eyes of the almighty Verius? So they have to 3-0 in, uh, in the second round, Robin. I think that it is possible. We know the capability and potential of this team. We saw how dominant they were during the regular season, and I feel that they have the talent to do it. But unless they do it today, I cannot consider them tournament favorites and back to pre-tournament expectations. Know. Yeah, and I think that when you come from a region like the LPL and you play so many games, they would be used to a format like this. So I'm very excited to see when they start playing these back-to-back -back games, how they're able to step up and take it to these other teams. I hope to see what FPX can do. And now, assuming that Fun Plus Phoenix maintain form and earn themselves a number one seed, I do want to get your thoughts on who might be second in this group of mess, as we have dubbed it. I have added a twist. I have three cards with the two threes and fours for now, so Gam, uh, J-Team, and Splice. You can draw one at random, and you have to give me your passionate explanation as to why. One. You want the middle one? I want the middle okay. one. What? Yep. Boom. Give me the middle one. I'm taking this. It's right. closest to me. What, That's what the did you All right, so who's first? Oh, okay. I'd like to see what, uh, what you got. Okay. Oh, got no. oh, this is the easiest thing. I actually <laughs> I believe have, this, oh, by no. the way. I have the oh, hardest no. one. <laughs> Raz, um, well, how, how would you like to go Let's first? Let's go Raz. Let's Raz? start with Raz. And we'll also okay. have a timer. You get 90 seconds. I'll count you in, and then you can go, okay? Perfect. You ready? Three, yes. two, one, JT. I mean, we've already seen them play. I mean, they already upset 
Not only one of the tournament favorites, but they did it in the group. So for me, Fofo is an insane uh, player. Also, we haven't seen the best of rest. So I think that the two solo laners have already showcased, for me, throughout the split, uh, that they're excellent performers. They are already taking down uh, Splice. And for me, I'm already flip-flopping in the tournament. I think JT, personal belief, I don't even need this, will take second place. Someone's going to wow. say that Raz doesn't like the LMS or something. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, listen to me! <laughs> uh, rebuttal from anyone? So I think that what's important to recognize about J-Team is that they're not good at snowballing or pushing their advantages. Mm -hmm. A lot of their leads purely come from Fofo. And in the one game that they lost against a certain Hagam, uh, this was when they attacked the mid lane directly and shut him down. And I think that with him removed, there's a very good chance that J-Team don't make it out of this group. Uh, you got, you had like 90 seconds, you used only 30. Yeah, so it's <laughs> so I'll just come out with a quick rebuttal and say that Lil V is, and the bottom side in particular are much better. Koala on engage options, specifically the pike, has showcased a lot of talent for me. Okay, there we go. We can uh, button this one up. You have 90 seconds if you want it, and I feel like you're going to need them for Convince Splice. Convince me, Spawn. All right, so the most practiced team on the world stage so far is Splice. <laughs> they play through play -ins. They played through all five games to make it to groups. So these guys know the pressure surely by now. And I think what we've seen is that they're a young lineup that needs to make the adaptations game to game. But when they come in with a good game plan, it does work. Cast your mind back to that matchup versus FPX where they were able to beat FPX to their own punch and punish that bottom lane that we're expecting a lot out of. So I have a lot of confidence behind these players. I think that if the young guys step up, mainly looking at North Skurin, as well as Humanoid in that mid game, that they're going to be able to have a more consistent performance. Now, what I need them to be able to do is group in the mid game. I think just simplify the game plan. When they go to 1-3-1, when they go to the full court press, they do make mistakes. So I'm hoping that we see a little bit more tank play or cannon play out of Chachi up there in the top lane and that the rest of the team is able to utilize that to set up things like the Baron area and generate advantageous team fights because they will get ahead early. Almost exactly 90 seconds. Oh. Actually, you do have some time left, but Raz, do you agree with that? Uh, I mean, my issue is the fact that you're right. Focus is going to be on Humanoid and Norse Garen, but I think they're underplaying, to be fair. And then if I look to the top side of the map, I'm seeing Zero, I'm seeing Rest, and I'm seeing Gimgun. Top side of the map right now is really detrimental for the side of Splice, so I think that's where they're going to suffer. Oh, the EU fanboy wants to say I mean, he's convinced Splice? me. I'm bought in. What? <laughs> Splice, uh, yeah. Splice, well, no, you already had them in your pick yeah. anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Yeah. So that means that I have to convince you all of the glory of GAM Esports. Now, GAM... They had a tumultuous group stage. They had mixed results. They struggled against Splice. They struggled against FPX. But today is the day that Gam turned it all around. Levi in the jungle, when all odds are against him, he will find new picks to break waves and reform the meta. Xeros has the potential to carry even the weakest teams to the greatest heights. Gam has the tools at their disposal to not just finish second in this group, to finish at the top, oh. and it all comes oh off the back God. of their jungle and top laner. Gam, I believe, the fans believe, it's your day to make it out of this oh, group. That was just so impressive. And look, I'm not one to let facts get in the way of a good story. Thank you, crowd, thank you. <laughs> no, come However, down, we can cut out. the segment Chill here. Out. On the international stage, Xeros has consistently underperformed. Yeah, oh, relevant. And <laughs> Levi did choke in the opportunity to be able to get out of groups previously. So apart from the facts, I, I think he's done a very good job. I agree. <laughs> now, what I do think is that it makes clear that you can make a solid case for every single one of these teams after FPX to get out. What are some of the factors that we think might influence them that aren't pertinent on we know they could because of X, Y, and Z? So I think one of the biggest things is the evolution of the meta and what becomes a priority in the second week. Because one of the things about best of ones are when you go up against these teams for the first time, you learn a lot more about their play style, you learn a lot more about what they prioritize and ban away in the draft, and your ability to adapt in a very short space of time and evolve your preparation will be a large part of determining which team is able to come out on top. I just think being the best you. This is one of the groups uh. where uh, we see so many different styles, but when it gets to the 20 minute mark, we see uh, all three teams really finding it difficult to, to close games when they have those advantages. So I'm looking at Splice and saying that 
uh, when they are making their own plays, specifically bot lane dies, mid lane plays, just not to flop the execution. So I think I'm very confident about meta. Play your own style, just play to the best of your abilities. And I just think consistency is key. And if the way you beat J Team today is go at Fofo, I don't know whether the teams have the tools to be able to do that. And J Team has shown that they are one of the most consistent teams domestically and have played to that same style today. So I would expect them to get out. Thank you all for your breakdown. We did hear now about the other teams, but before we jump in to that first game, Doing B shares what it feels like being at his first Worlds. This is my first World Cup match, I feel like it's quite fun. And because it's... Last year, last year, it was a little bit of a World Cup match. And then I feel like there was no chance to go to the World Cup match. But this year, I feel like it's quite fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so Awesome. Uh, turning back towards game one, it is hard not to think of the last time FPX and GAM Esports faced off a couple of days ago. The LPL reps smashed GAM Esports, and a lot of that was also this man, Doombi. Yeah, Doombi came into this tournament uh, really with a lot on his shoulders, pressure on there, people having those discussions about like top 20, and he performed outright. And alongside uh, Tien. Doombi and Tien are the people who end up getting the motor going up to the top side of the map or bot lane dives, and I think they were able to consistently achieve that. And I think the thing about Doombi that people need to remember is that whilst he's not the best laner, the importance of the early game is there, and he does play against some of the best mid laners in the world, so it's not like he's any slouch in those 1v1 mechanics. I think it was slept on how well he was going to be able to do. He has built some big CS leads for himself, and he's done it on his champions, which is so important for this Fun Plus Phoenix lineup. And there's a big reason why for so many people, Tian and Doonbi were put so highly on their top 20 lists. And it's the synergy and what they're capable of doing. And it's because in the early game, Tian is the, the, the pace setter. He's the one that makes a lot of things happen for FPX. And we got to see a great example of that yesterday in their game, uh, or the other day in their game against Gam. I don't think he's ever gonna be allowed to play Kiana <laughs> again, but he then sets up Doonbi to be the carry later on and their synergy and coordination is what makes this FPX team so strong. Yeah, and I'm never concerned about his champion pool, his Lee Sin, his Echo, his J4. I know that you meant, made a mention that uh, that Clid you would say is the best jungler right now in the tournament. I think for sure Tien and he doesn't get any of the like mainstay credit because of how new he is to this stage. What does he have over Clid? For him, he is incredibly consistent to being able to match the enemy jungle. He, being able to cover both mid and bot side waves, I think he's the most intelligent jungler we have in the tournament. And I think it's important to recognize the other big carry on this team in Crisp. The man actually works extremely well to enable Tian to do a lot of the things that he does. And the amount of times that Crisp roams mid lane to further support Doonbi is a credit to how impactful this guy is. I think that a large part of what sets up FPX as a team is not because they have superstars, but because of the teamwork and coordination and how well they all complement each other. Yeah, they're a very fun team to watch as well, but we can't count GAM Esports out yet. You already said it, they, they kind of have the history with Levi speaking for them, and he is still one of the big, big players on that lineup. And I think if you have a look at a team like GAM, they're not going to be worried about getting beaten quickly. They're a team that does play a fast style of League of Legends themselves, and sometimes when that backfires, it does so spectacularly. And they've also shown us multiple different looks, so I'm expecting them to have a new game plan today versus FPX. I hope it does revolve around a Kled mid lane because Doonby has played it himself in the past, and it would be so fun to see that matchup, but I think that there will be something fun, there will be something a lot quicker, and I just hope it's team fight reliant, Raz. What I love is the fact that we have three Kled players in this game, not just talking about Kiaya, but Doombi and Gimgoon, both uh, mainstay Kled, although haven't played it for this split, I'm talking about FPX, but talking about the, the Marines here, what I'm surprised about, you already talked about the multiple play styles that they go for in Champion Select, They've, I know the, the mainstay Taku is like uh, jack of all trades, master of none. They look like a master at the picks that they go for. So I think mm -hmm. they play to their compositions very consistently. What is the difference in this GAM from previous years, knowing that before, is it just a group and the group style? Because before, they were challenging teams like Fnatic in the group stage as well and almost got to the next one. Yeah, I think this time around, it's easier to play towards your top side of the map because they play a lot of things like Garen Yumi. So you're able to shore up that weakness down bottom and give a lot of resources towards Xeros. That's what we saw. Jax pickups, you know, a lot of things like Kennen being played as well domestically. And then Levi with a very high jungle proximity around 
around that top lane. So I think that that is an area where it's much easier to play through and not necessarily have to rely on your bottom lane to carry. And I think draft is going to be very important. We've already talked a lot about it for this team, but it feels like Levi needs to be on something that he can have impact on in the early game because that is what it ultimately boils down to for Gam. They either win hard and fast or they lose hard and fast. And you know that once they get a lead, they will continue to engage and engage. But a lot of that comes off the back of their man in the jungle. So he has to be put on a pick that he can find the success with. And their worst performance so far has been against Splice. And yes. that was 100% a draft issue in my mind because they ran into a Splice team that was not willing to fight them like they would have in the VCS with no engage options. So I think that they will be able to remedy that. And FPX as a team will be much more willing to engage in some of the shenanigans that Gam relies on for their gold generation where a team like Splice was not. I agree with the draft point. I also think that looking to the bottom side of the map, they're going to be outmatched by LWX and Crisp, so I would like to see them on, once again, mage bottom lanes. We already talked about it pretty heavily on the top of show, and I just want to be able to see that creativity to be able to band-aid that bottom You side. talk about the bottom lane for FPX specifically. Are you also looking at that bottom lane to have a better performance than in the first phase of groups? Because I know that we were throwing some criticism on the way of LWX in the first couple of games. Oh, 100%. I think that was the worst game that I've seen from him during this play. Ever? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So coming into this one, I think that he's going to perform much, much better. And also, Crisp was LPL Summer Split Finals MVP. He's an insane support, and if things don't work out bot side, he's going to end up going mid. Yeah, and look, I call uh, LWX Name, right? And I don't think <laughs> any bigger jinx exists on the global stage because what they are able to do is kind of roam crisp out of that lane, support a lot of players on the map, but LWX will still get his farm and still team fight very well. He is insanely aggressive in these team fights. He will often frontline on things like Kaiser, like the Lucians, but that's a double-edged sword. If you're not expecting it, you do get blown away. If you lay the traps, then it can also explode in your face. And I think for predictions, expectations should be that FPX are the clear favorites. Mm -hmm coming into mm -hmm. this game. Yeah. But what we can say for sure is that Gam will not make the same mistake of giving away the Kiana over the FPX, especially given that they have first pick. But the other thing is that we know that both these teams will fight you regardless. So as long as it doesn't descend into chaos like we saw in the last time they matched up, there is a good chance that there will be a lot of back and forth and it will come down to raw mechanics that can determine the outcome of this. As we get closer and closer to this game, it's also important to note again, all games of this group get played in this day. So those um, mental issues that can arise when you lose that first one and have to go back on stage for the other one. It's so important to win that first game, but for Gam, it looks like a very tough one. So how do you think the rest of their day will go depending on this possible loss for FPX? Well, the good news is they get the break after the yeah. first game, right? So that is going to be big for the mental reset. If they had to play FPX into someone like J-Team, I'd be very worried for them, but Tinny Kun is an experienced coach and should be able to get them back on track. And they also get to see J-Team play in the game right mm -hmm. afterwards. So they already have the information and can make on, on a fly. Adjustment. But that's assuming that they lose. That's assuming <laughs> I know you have uh, the faith in them, so we're going to track that. The pressure is definitely on for the teams in Group B. Let's see out who comes out on top and overcomes.